programming is brought to you by Local Video Marketing. In association with CoachChick.com Chick is known around the hockey world as the master of skill development. He is especially known for problem solving and the ability to design progressions that bring players along, slowly but surely, from point A to point B to point C and higher. Now retired to Florida, he shares 50 years of experience through a membership website called CoachChick.com. Charter members to his site currently enjoy a reduced membership fee. However, as of this date, the cost of membership will rise. So, please do check out his site, and consider joining as soon as possible. Hey there, it's Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD, and I'm coming to you from our little kitchen in Greenville, North Carolina. And, and I know I usually come on and I do a little PowerPoint presentation about nutrition. However, it is the last presentation that I'm creating for the month of December, and boy, what a year it has been. So yes, I'm going to give you some pointers about nutrition in just a minute, but I want you to think about this. I know the, some of the skaters in my Create a Championship Plate program have been fortunate enough to be on the ice during this entire pandemic. Others have had a stop and start season. 
And I'd like you to consider this. There are two foundations to youth ice hockey nutrition. Success. The first is learning how to skate. You remember when your skater learned how to skate, it wasn't easy, they had to practice, they fell down, and they got frustrated, but they kept on learning because they knew once they learned how to skate, they would know how to skate on a daily basis without even thinking about it. It would become automatic. And once that skating became automatic, they got to start learning how to play the game of hockey. Well, what fuels their skating so that they have success every time that they step on the ice is success being measured as they get on the ice and they have enough energy to give 100%. That is their hockey nutrition. Hockey nutrition is a skill, just like skating, that has to be learned and practiced every day in small amounts, depending on the age that your skater's at when they start learning nutrition. It's going to vary. You know, an eight year old is going to understand a little bit less about nutrition than, say, a 12 year old. However, I will tell you that I have an eight year old, nine year old goalie now that when they're at the dinner table, his mother has more success getting him to eat his carbs and protein on his plate than eating his meat and potatoes. So this young man, even though he's in the third grade, he's started to make the connection between what he's eating and how he's playing in the net. And he just got his first shutout in his game this weekend. I'm so proud of him. So in moving into the Christmas holiday, and it's still the off season or forced off season for many, many skaters are on a hiatus for about three or four weeks, maybe even more. I want you to consider and really think about helping your skater eat three good meals a day and three hockey strong snacks and moving towards more whole foods, more fruits and vegetables, less packaged foods, when you can do it, less takeout foods at the fast food restaurants. And if you would like a copy of my in-season meal plan template, I am more than happy to send it to you. You can email me at kim at hockeymomrd.com and just type meal plan in the, in the subject line. You can also visit my website, www.hockeymomrd.com and sign up for my Eat, Skate, Win five-day challenge. Now, what it is, it's a five-day course that's delivered to you through your email. So once you get the email, you get the information and the module that you can work on again and again. And this five-day program has helped skaters get like a quick jump start on their hockey nutrition and in their performance. So make it a great rest of the month stay focused on hockey nutrition if i can be of help to you or to your team or to both feel free to reach out to me at kim at hockeymomrd.com happy skating till next time take you through what I think is a very unique two-part series on how to use what I think is the most underrated and underappreciated band, the dynamic stabilizer. And why do I think this? Because I think people look at this as being used for one exercise, maybe two at the most, and that's completely false. This little device could be the best cardiovascular training band yet. And I want to take you through today six exercises and then give you progressions of each exercise to show you just how versatile this little band is. So this first part, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about exercises that are gonna engage your trunk and engage your hips. I think these first three exercises and progressions that come with it are the 
perfect three exercises you want to put together in a workout, the beginning of a workout, where you're engaging your trunk and your hips to get started. So if you have a group training group that you want to use the dynamic stabilizer for, or if you want to go ahead and do an aggressive running workout, but you want to make sure everything's on board, these first three exercises are what you want to go ahead and incorporate first into your workout before you go ahead and show and I take you through part two, which is going to be a little bit more cardiovascular oriented. You ready to go ahead and hit it? All right, enjoy these three workouts, but more importantly, clue in on how quickly you can progress each workout, or excuse me, each exercise as you go through it. One well, guys, we're on the floor today because we're going through dynamic stabilizer mountain climbers. This is probably one of my favorite exercises because it allows me to get, engage my trunk, train my trunk and my hips at the same time. The key is making sure you set up correctly. You want a wide base of support. So you want to get your feet wide so that the band stays tight. You want to position yourself in this holding pattern. Now, when you go to go ahead and do the movement, you want your knee coming towards your elbow. What that will do is that will keep the band tight and allow you to go ahead and do the mountain climber without the band migrating up and down your legs. So that's the basic dynamic stabilizer mountain climber. Let me take you through some variations of how you can do this now. Three variations of how you can progress your dynamic stabilizer mountain climber. Obviously you'd always start with the standard one that I just showed you, but now you can go ahead and load it up by taking the second band, placing it on the small of your back, wide base of support, and go ahead and do your dynamic stabilizer mountain climber with a loaded band. That's going to engage your trunk more aggressively. Another way to go ahead and do it, if you want to go ahead and advance it and be a little faster, is position yourself on an elevated surface. Now, by doing the mountain climber on this, it's going to take and make it a little bit easier for you to do than the standard position. However, I like to use this position to be more aggressive by doing what I call the switch drill where I'm constantly trying to explode off of the movement. So there's three progressions and how you can go ahead incorporate the dynamic stabilizer mountain climber in your exercise is dynamic stabilizer rhythmical reaches. They're designed to go ahead and get your hips activated by not only creating a sagittal plane reach but also by creating a frontal plane force from the dynamic stabilizer. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to start my reach by reaching high. So I'm going to kick my leg out and touch the wall and then bring it on back. Make sure that you go ahead and touch the floor with your back foot. Touch something with your hand, be it the wall or a stool or even the floor. So that's the dynamic rhythmical reach. Now what you want to do is put rhythm with it by being able to either repeat that movement multiple times or you can go ahead and create an alternating version which is really going to go ahead and be a great exercise for gait training. Now let me take you through some variations of how you can incorporate the rhythmical reach into your workout. If you're just learning the rhythmical reach, my suggestion is use a surface that you can touch so that you don't have to go down as low and you can really focus on going ahead and kicking that leg back and reaching and making sure the dynamic stabilizer stays tight during the entire movement. Once you're good at that, now you can go ahead and go to the floor which will be even more aggressive movement, or you can go ahead and load it with a weight by going ahead and bringing a dumbbell in and just reaching down and loading the movement. So there's three ways to go ahead and progress the rhythmical reach. And remember, you can also make it an alternating reach by going ahead and going back and forth from side to side if you want to. Rhythmical reaches, guys, great way to go ahead and train your hips if deadlifts aren't what you always want to do. Come on, guys, today's exercise is a dynamic stabilizer squat. I want you to go ahead, step into the band, place it right above your kneecaps. That's where you're gonna hold it. Now we want it there so that we teach our hips to engage during this exercise. Placing the band at your ankle won't allow that. So the simple variation of this is feet straight ahead, just go into a nice reach. The reach places you, a, creates a counterbalance for your hips so that you learn how to drive your hips back while keeping the band pressed out, knees over top of your ankles. So that's the dynamic stabilizer squat. Now let me take you through three variations of how you can go ahead and progress this exercise. First variation is a loaded dynamic stabilizer squat. I'm gonna use a band, you could use weights. I'm gonna bring it on up and I'm gonna go ahead and load 
my squad. So I've got a red band. You go ahead and pick the band that works best for you, but you're essentially gonna do a front squat with the dynamic stabilizer. Another variation is to go ahead and do what we call a ground up squat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the squat, hold it, and then we're gonna come on out of it. So we're gonna go all the way down, hold it, but we're not gonna let our trunk go, not let our hips go, and then we're gonna come out of it. If you wanna go ahead and progress that, you can go ahead, lower down, and come on out of it with a little bit of a hop, exploding up. Last variation is my favorite, is just a simple squat jump and making sure you always stick the landing. So a plyo squat jump. Three variations of how you can go ahead and incorporate this exercise into your workout. part one of my dynamic stabilizer series. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring you part two. Today's exercise is a dynamic stabilizer skater exercise. Now this is an advanced exercise because we're going to add a lot of plyometric and heavy ground reaction forces. So make sure you're ready for it. The skater is no, known for its ability to create an explosive step, stick the landing, and then come on back. So that's the first key. The second key and a mistake that people make often is as they do the skater, they let this foot either touch or wrap around. If you do that, the band is gonna get loose and slide. So you wanna go ahead, as you do your skater, keep the distance between your feet at least 12 to 18 inches as you're going ahead and getting it moving. Last thing, make sure you get your arms involved because you wanna do that to make it a total body movement. Now let me take you through how to progress this exercise. The simplest way to go ahead and progress the skater is create a reach. And where you go ahead and create that reach relative to the ground is gonna make this exercise more challenging. Let me show you what I mean. Progression number one would just be a simple skater movement, and all you're worried about is letting your arms move. Secondly, I'm gonna go ahead and reach down and touch my knee as I go ahead and do the movement. Now, this is gonna create more hip flexion, which is gonna result in my glutes working more. Final progression, try to touch your ankle. So you're gonna go all the way down to the ankle, which is gonna create a ton of hip flexion and make your glutes really have to work, not only in the frontal plane, but in the sagittal plane. Three progressions for your skaters. Bring them into your workout once you've mastered some lateral stepping and you wanna move things up a bit. Have a great time with it. Today's exercise is step overs. Yeah, dynamic stabilizer step overs. Love this movement because it not only engages my glute medius, to become stronger in the frontal plane, but it also engages my hip flexor to become stronger in the sagittal plane. So you're getting a two for one deal here. Very simple exercise. Put an object down that you can go ahead and visualize stepping over. Don't make it too high to start out with. Let your feet start moving to just get into a rhythm and then step over the move object. Just step over the object. That's all you're working on. Always come to a balance and then step over the movement. Don't try to go quickly over it. Work on your rhythm and control, because after you get that, now you can go ahead and go through some of these progressions that I'm about to show. Progression number one is just simply working on quick, explosive movements. So you're in this position, you wanna get over the object as quick as you can and get moving as quick as you can. That's first progression. Second progression, add a second step in. So you're here, you wanna step over and get your balance again, and then step over and then get your balance. That's the second level of progression. Last one you can go ahead and do is you can go ahead and incorporate a shuffle back. So you're here, step over, and then shuffle it back. Keep your feet moving, step over, and then shuffle it back. Just make sure you go both directions when you do that. Step over movements, great way to engage your hip flexors and train your glute medius in the frontal plane. Give it a try, you're gonna see your heart rate go way up which is what I really enjoy. If you're looking for a small space cardiovascular type exercise that's really gonna get your heart rate up, two-step shuffles is a great option. Yeah, put the dynamic stabilizer on so you can train your hips in, in a frontal plane, but you're also gonna work them in a very fast movement. Put some markers down so you have a distance to shoot for, and you're gonna do two to three steps, stop, and then come on back. So it's one, two, get here, and then come on back. That's the basic two-step shuffle. 
you're going to scale your speed to what you can do and you're also going to go ahead and challenge yourself to always keep your feet shoulder width or farther apart during this movement which is going to work on great balance and basis support strength so that's the two-step shuffle I snapped this photo in the summer of 1979. Actually, I stumbled across this seemingly secret training session one day as I roamed the expansive maze of corridors in the Moscow Institute for Sport and Physical Culture. What's going on here is that the overhead cable and harness arrangement is lifting the sprinter so that he weighs less than normal and so that he can run an awful lot faster than under normal conditions. This in mind, let me share an example that I often use to break this point. Consider the act of running up a hill. A runner is working against gravity here, challenging his leg strength and his conditioning. However, what you might not have considered is the fact that this sort of training is also teaching the runner's body to work slower than if he was running on a flat surface. Now, let's compare that with a runner moving down an incline. You know the feeling. With gravity sucking you down the hill, there's almost a fear of losing control. For, under such circumstances, the runner is actually running faster than if he was on level ground. And this is a fairly good example of overspeed work in that the athlete is being assisted in the movement. In his body, and all of its neuromuscular signaling devices are being familiarized with a faster pace. As a sidebar here, appreciate that some negative influences like slowness or poor mechanics can come about from the wearing of heavy, bulky, or tight gear. That's why I like to reduce the amount of equipment or clothing my players wear anytime I want them to work on quickness or speed. Now, overspeed drill methods can be pretty varied, but they almost always have a common approach in that a movement is assisted in order to help a player to move faster than usual. Here's another idea I brought back from Moscow. A number of things are going on, but you should see how the movement is being aided as this young hockey player attempts to use the ball in order to jump as high as possible. And I'll suggest that there's at least a slight overspeed component to hopping on this mini trampoline since that springy gadget greatly aids my students' movements. One way I've found to assist crossovers is through the use of centrifugal force. Of course, as with almost all of these exercises, there's some danger involved as players take turns whipping one another around at a near frightening pace. Then, for even more ideas, I might suggest looking at the numerous ways movements are traditionally resisted so as to bring about strength gains. For, if you just reverse most of those drills or the training devices, you'll likely get the opposite 
overspeed effect. For example, bungees can be reversed, thereby helping the player to take off faster than he would under typical circumstances. And this slingshot effect can be gained in a number of different ways, as well as in a number of different training venues. I believe there's also an overspeed benefit to this one. Here, my guys are initially being resisted by their partner. However, after just a few seconds, the partner lets go, allowing the skater to bust out at a fairly good clip. Of course, some elite level athletes have also used various mechanized devices in pursuit of speed. So, while I'm not recommending any of these, I guess it's necessary for me to at least point out the use of automobiles, motorized cable systems, and fast spinning treadmills as yet other means of training at a faster than normal pace. Finally, although everything I've described to this point primarily involves some sort of unique physical challenge, I'm going to suggest that there is a huge mental side to speed training. Think back, if you will, to what it feels like to run down a hill. Think also about what it might be like to experience the various ways I've described to propel someone beyond their usual capacity. For then you might understand why I'm constantly talking to my players about going beyond their comfort zones or about pushing the envelope. Yeah, I truly believe that overcoming the fear factor in moving at a new speed plays a major role in actually achieving it.
they had a wider left stride, they had a wider right stride, and then when they measured their angle of hip, what we call hip abduction, so that would be the angle from here with my hip, the faster skaters had a wider angle. In other words, the faster skaters had a much wider stride. Now, if you can watch a, a game, whoever it is, and you will notice that the faster skaters typically, traditionally, and consistently will push to the side. So four of the eight have to do with the wide stride. Some of the other characteristics are a quick recovery. So in other words, after you push off, after that player push off, pushes off a fast skater, he or she will get her skate, his or her skate on the ice as quickly as possible. Another characteristic is once they recover, once their blade lands flat, they turn that skate into the push-off skate really, really fast. And this is something that we have found with female players with about three studies that we have done. Wide stride and quick recovery. So watch how, watch how quickly he gets the skate back on the ice. That's the reason Nolan is so fast. And then we've got Chris, who also is one of the best skaters in his league and on his team. Wide stride, quick recovery. Now, some of the ones that are very consistent and most people will agree with is that faster skaters have a deeper knee bend when they start to push off, as well as a significant forward lean. So those are the eight skating characteristics, the eight differences between fast skaters and slow skaters. Coach Chick is known around the hockey world as the master of skill development. He is especially known for problem solving and the ability to design progressions that bring players along, slowly but surely, from point A to point B to point C and higher. Now retired to Florida, he shares 50 years of experience through a membership website called CoachChick.com. Charter members to his site currently enjoy a reduced membership fee. However, as of this date, the cost of membership will rise. So, please do check out his site, and consider joining as soon as possible. Just so our hockey friends know, there's now a big difference between CoachChick.com and the Mastermind Group. The world's best hockey information website can now be found at CoachChick.com. This has been a local video marketing production. We hope you've enjoyed this and that you've picked up a number of great hockey tips. Please do tell some friends about these shows and let the contributing coaches know how much you appreciate them.